Okay, everyone, welcome back one more time. Any questions, please put them into the chat or feel free to unmute and ask our guests yourselves. Um, and without further ado, uh, Phyllis. Welcome everyone. I'm happy to get Foodie Fridays back on the uh, agenda again. And we're going to start with um, this tofu program that's gonna change your attitude about tofu. If you have never mm -hmm. tried it, you are going to be surprised. And I'm not gonna waste a lot of time because I know we wanna cook. And so I'm gonna turn this over to Amy. who's got a little introduction for us. Well, what I've been thinking about as we were preparing for today's uh, get together, uh, I remembered over the summer, I watched the Netflix series High on the Hog, which was uh, hosted by the culinary historian Jessica Harris. And she made a comment in one of the episodes that I thought kind of uh, specifies what all of uh, food and food interest and food preparation is about. She said, through food, we can find out there's more that connects us than separates us. What we eat and what we discover bring us together. So courtesy of today's hosts, we're discovering the marriage of tofu with, in particular today, a couple of dishes that we don't normal or, normally, or at least I don't normally associate with tofu. So our two hosts are George Stiffman, who has interestingly developed an interest in plant-based food as a high school student. And from there, he studied in China and uh, not only studied in China, but he worked in China. And one of the places I believe was a traditional Chinese tofu shop. So then his partner in uh, tofu is David Lesbron, who has honed his culinary skills by working through many, many, many of Los Angeles' most fun restaurants. So let's go ahead and uh, learn to embrace tofu in time for the holidays. So George and David, it's up to you. Awesome, thanks so much for the intro, Amy. And it's great to be here. Uh, my name is again, George. This is David. Uh, and we're working right now on a cookbook on sharing Chinese tofus within Western cooking. Um, we have, it took us a while to get to this point, but uh, we're really hopeful that uh, Chinese tofu could be a food that Westerners embrace. Um, and the reason for it is that it's somewhat misunderstood currently in the US. More and more people want to eat plant-based or more plants, um, and yet we don't have enough tools to do so. Uh, and tofu uh, is this thing where in China, it's an entire category of ingredients, over 20 different individual things. Uh, and in the West, we have a couple of them, firm and soft and silken. Uh, but there's so much more. And so we're writing a cookbook called Broken Cuisine that seeks to uh, propose some ways to use it. Uh, so today we're just sharing a few recipes from our cookbook and going to describe a little bit about tofu and what it is and all that, all that stuff. Um, our first on the menu is a pistachio baklava made with <laughs> a... Um, sorry, our... Uh, <laughs> our exhaust fan keeps coming on because the kitchen's hot. Um, so let me know if it gets like a little bit loud and we'll try to talk louder. Um, Sound is great right now. Sound is great right now. You're good. Great. Um, so we're going to be sharing a pistachio baklava recipe using one rare Chinese tofu uh, called yuba. And we're going to be doing after that a farro grain bowl uh, with another type, uh, really nice pressed tofu. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, we're going to get started. Uh, we'll, we, can get, we can get going with the first one. Uh, cool. Um, so our first type of tofu that we're going to be using today is called yuba. And it's what it is, is if you take soy milk and boil it, there's a thin film that will form on the surface that's really high in protein and really rich with uh, nice beanie flavors. Um, that film is sometimes dried slightly, and then it it's these like very high protein thin sheets that are traditionally uh, used in cold dishes and like salads uh, or wrapped around uh, vegetables and steamed or fried. We found that using it in Western cooking as like a pastry crust also works really well. 
some to something totally different. So we're gonna use this kind of like phyllo pastry, uh, laminate it with some coconut oil, uh, mix it with some nuts and uh, all seasonings, and then bake it. Um, so the first step of that is gonna open the package. And George, what's interesting to me is it doesn't say Yuba on the package, but, but it did say bean curd pastry, or maybe I just didn't see it. So bean curd, okay. Okay, cool. And then where would we, okay, here's the question. Where would one buy all these different types of uh, tofu? Yeah, so one issue, one challenge right now that we found is that the names of these tofus are not standardized. And oh. don't really aren't used much in the U.S., so don't have great English names. Um, so in Chinese, this is actually called tofu skin uh, or tofu pi. Uh, but people often think, well, tofu skin, that kind of sounds, you know, <laughs> like I don't want to eat skin. It's kind of whatever. Um, not great connotations. Um, so we, but there's a Japanese name for it, Yuba, that is a little bit accepted. Uh, oh, food. okay. And this guy... Um, you can find Yuba at a lot of Asian supermarkets. Um, this particular one that we like is a little bit thinner than most varieties. Um, and this is like uh, uh, specifically sold at some of the Chinese markets in San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles. Um, so we can send recommendations for grocery stores too, if that would help. Oh, that would be fantastic. So that sounds like a tofu field trip. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, every time I have friends who are interested in this stuff, I'll try to take them, find an excuse to take them out there because uh, it's just, it's amazing how many, how many ingredients there are that, you know, are really popular in one culture, but just aren't really used so much by others. Uh, but as you, as you can see, this is like a huge sheet, very, very, very fine. Oh, it's wow. huge. Wow. <gasps> So you can, this is totally translucent. I mean, you can see, you can, transparent. I mean, you can see oh, right through yeah. it. Um, and what happens is when you baste it with oil and then bake it, it turns really flaky, um, like a, like a phyllo dough. Yeah. Um, so start by trimming this down. Um, right. separate George, the layers just so. George, someone asked if that was in the refrigerator selection or the, or on the shelf of the stores, just to be more specific. Uh, so there's sometimes shelf stable Yuba, mm -hmm. and what that is is it's just it's the same stuff. It's just dehydrated all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we found that the stuff that's refrigerated or frozen tends to be a little mm -hmm. bit easier to use. It's a little juicier. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, the texture is a for this application is is much better. So definitely the refrigerated or frozen section. Can you that, lift that up while you do that? Yeah. The camera is, we're missing some of that action. It's, yes. it's huge. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, crazy big. Um, um, it's a little sticky too. Um, but, but it seems like it has a very tensile uh, strength to it. It doesn't mm -hmm. tear. Mm -hmm. It is pretty, it is pretty tough. A little bit elastic -y. Um All right, so let's start with one more of these and then we'll trim that up. All right. So for baking it, you can use whatever pan you have that, that you like best. Um, you can use a loaf pan. That, that, that's like kind of easy and size-wise works pretty well. Um, we're going to be using just one of these like, I don't know, what is this called? Like a party tray or, um, and we're going to trim it to that size. Eight by eight inch baking pan. Um, all right, so just going to put this down on, on top. Trim a little bit outside. Uh, you can trim a little bit wider. You don't need to go super close because the pan opens up a little bit in the tray. Uh, just going to trim around that way, around that side. Like 
Thanks. All right, so now we're just working with these squares. Um, you can usually do 12 or 15 of them. Either way is fine. Um, we're going to start now by uh, using some refined, uh, some virgin coconut oil to base the pan so the bottom doesn't stick. Um, and then we're going to put a layer of aluminum or tin foil on top of that and then base that again. This helps to when you want to get the baklava out, it comes out really nice and easy. Um, all right. So after that, we're going to take our filling. Um, we got some brown pistachios, some brown walnuts, um, and a little bit. You can either use cinnamon or we also like pumpkin spice seasoning. It, it works really well. Mm -hmm. similar, similar flavors. Um, mix that up. Uh, we are nuts in here. The pistachios already come with salt, um, so we're not going to add more. But if you use unsalted nuts, then by all means, add a pinch of salt here. Mm. All right. So this is just super simple. This is basically like if you're using phyllo pastry, it's the same way. You just layer a sheet in. Um, we're going to brush it with oil. Mm. So we're getting both for texture and then also so we get that nice coconut flavor in there. Um, I mean, this is a we're working with vegan recipes here, so not using honey, but you know, if you do eat honey, that's totally fine as well. Now we're gonna take half a cup of the filling and just sprinkle it over the top. Uh, or if you like to add a little bit more, you can do that too. And just uh, repeat. So we're gonna do, now we're gonna do uh, three sheets of the yuba, brushed with oil, one on top of the other, and then we're gonna add another layer of the nuts. Oh. Each sheet we're just brushing oil on again. So it, it looks as though you can keep the Yuba sheet out in the air instead of with phyllo where you've got to, um, you know, keep the sheets moist. That's a big advantage. Well, to be honest, these also do dry out a bit. Um, oh, okay. So, I mean, because we're working fast, it, it, it's okay. But if you're going to be doing a couple of fruits at the same time and aren't going to be you know, focus on it, then I would definitely recommend okay. this block. And um, if, if it gets dry, you can also recover it by just, you know, covering it with a moist cloth. So it's okay. maybe a little bit easier to use than mm -hmm. people in that sense. Yeah, and we did get a question about the recipes, and uh, George and uh, David have said that they will be definitely sharing recipes with us. And also, based on the beginning of our conversation, George is going to be telling us some places where we can buy the, uh, the Yuba and other wonderful tofu products, which would be really valuable. Yeah, we'll be sharing all that information um, after this, so you can... Hopefully, try some of these recipes at home uh, if you'd like, or uh, at least so you know more about more about these ingredients. Yeah. Then I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about the cookbook too, Broken mm -hmm. Cuisine, that is in the works. Yeah, well, Broken Cuisine. Um, came about because when I, I went plant-based, a vegetarian in high school, um, and found it really tough. A lot of people, um, let's see, uh, you know, a lot of people who, oh, David, you mind flipping the breaker again so we can get the oven? Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people who go plant-based will tell you, oh, it's super easy, it's just a quick fix, whatever. Um, for me, it was a little bit more of a process of finding new foods and, um, 
didn't really like a lot of the stuff out there. Uh, but after going plant-based, I ended up spending a summer in China, um, just a little, like study Mandarin, uh, kind of like a cultural exchange. Um, and while I was there, I was just blown away by the amount of plant-based foods in China. Like, uh, there was the entire breakfast cuisine of the city I was staying in, um, Tianjin, was almost like probably 80% plant-based. Um, mm. So I was like, man, huh, if we had more food to eat like these in the States, it would just be so much easier. So I spent the next few years uh, studying Mandarin, uh, learning, uh, or going back to China, and um, I ended up working at a couple plant-based restaurants there to see if, you know, I could learn some some things to take back. Um, one thing led to another, um, and uh, I, I kind of, my passion from the cuisine side ended up transitioning more towards tofu, uh, which is kind of the fun, fundamental uh, base of plant-based Chinese food. Um, and like in the States, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not the best at multitasking, but uh, the baklava is done now, so I'm gonna throw it in the oven uh, just to bake. Um, and we have one that's already made, um, so you'll get to see what it looks like. It takes 45 minutes, so it might not be done by the time we call. Uh, and so while that's baking, we're gonna start preparing a syrup to put on top. Um, what temperature? We're gonna be baking at 350. I think that's uh, 350 for 45 to 55 minutes, depending on the state of your oven. Um, if you use convection, it's going to be a little bit quicker, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so on top of the baklava, we're going to make a simple syrup, uh, just water and sugar. Heat that up until it boils and dissolves. And then we're going to be mixing in a little bit of maple syrup and uh, Reducing that so it's a little thick. Um, so I can sit there for a minute. Uh, but yeah, so I ended up studying a lot of vegan Chinese food. Um, thought, you know, if we had some more of this food back in the States, people like me would find it so much easier. Uh, but over time, I realized that sometimes foods from other cultures are a little bit too foreign for your average person. And that maybe the taste is just a little bit new or the texture is a little new. Yeah. Um, so it's sometimes a hard sell. Uh, but so I ended up thinking, you know, maybe we don't need to translate an entire cuisine to the US. Maybe we just find one little nugget that people can, you know, become interested in. And that nugget uh, for me was tofu. Uh, so wow. I ended up, after that point, studying abroad in China for college, and during that time, apprenticing in an ancient tofu factory, kind of in the west of the country, uh, mm -hmm. where I learned about some really interesting varieties. Uh, and after that, uh, since graduating and coming back to the States, I've been working with Chef David and our friend Vanessa to, and Phyllis as well has been helping with it mm -hmm. um, on the editing side, to find ways to incorporate these ingredients into Western cooking uh, through this cookbook. Is it possible to substitute stevia and uh, uh, sugar-free maple syrup with the recipe? Sure. Yeah, you can use whatever sweeteners you like best. Um, if it, it it helps if it's like a little bit sticky, um, mm -hmm. just so it'll it'll cling better to the pastry. But yeah, you can definitely use whatever whatever sweetener you like best. Uh, agave is also good. Good question. Um, so now the, the syrup is mostly dissolved. So we're gonna add the maple and just start reducing that uh, for 20, 30 minutes until it's two thirds the volume. Uh, so while that's cooking, uh, Chef David is gonna talk a little bit more about the next dish, which is a farro grain bowl. Um, and so we'll come back to the bakula in just a second. We're getting our dessert first. Yeah. <laughs> well, life is short. Eat dessert first, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. 
Yeah, you can move this. It's not a day to be in the kitchen in Los Angeles. Oh, it's 91 no. degrees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in <it's>... November. <laughs> it's the middle of November. Yeah, and I, I think it's. Like, this is like normal <laughs> for Thanksgiving, you know, Thanksgiving season. Yeah, it's 83 degrees here in Manhattan Beach, and that's hot. That's it's hot. hot. It's 91 in, in Whoa. my neighborhood. Oh, yeah, that's really hot. So George is going to kind of talk about the topos we're using for the Faro brain bowl. Why don't you roll on them? Yeah, so the first type of topo we used, again, was yuba, or um, in Chinese, it's called tofu pi, tofu skin. The next type we're using is uh, pressed tofu. It's Chinese, it's called dou gan. And the way this is made is if you take an extra firm block of tofu, um, but you, or you, you, you press tofu as if it's going to become like an extra firm block, but then you stew it in spices. Uh, so specifically cinnamon, anise, fennel seed, uh, that, that kind of stuff, and a little bit of soy sauce. Uh, what, what that does to it is it gives it both a nice juicy texture, not juicy, but it's a little bit more moist than the extra firm we have in the States. And it also has this extra layer of flavor, so you don't need to worry about seasoning it as much. Um, mm. So we have a couple of types here. This one is the stewed one that I mentioned. And this is a type that's both stewed and then smoked over wood mm -hmm. fire. And so it also has those extra aromas. Um, you can get these at most Chinese supermarkets. They're not super common in Japanese cuisine or uh, any other Asian cuisine. So it, Chinese markets are really your best bet for them. And again, we'll send uh, information about where you can go in LA and all that. Um, well, yeah, so that's the tofu. And then I'm going to Dana take it away for the actual showing how to how to make this thing. Okay. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask anytime. So um, I live near a lot of Korean markets. Would they carry any of that? Or you really have to go to a Chinese market? So there are some Korean markets that will carry it. Um, I know that H Mart in Koreatown does. Oh, they have oh. one brand that is not it's not the best quality out there, but it's it's definitely good enough for most of the stuff we're doing. Um, I think if you want to get like more specific varieties, though, then the Chinese markets are your best bet. Mm -hmm. oh. H Mart definitely has it in Koreatown, though, so you can you should be able to find it there. All right, so all right, David. Mm -hmm. So the, the cool thing about the baklava dish is you can throw it on a, on a cake plate with a little lid on it and leave it out all day. So if you like, you wake oh. up in the morning, you want a cup of coffee and it's a little piece of baklava, it's there. Like it's very stable mm -hmm. because of the amount of, uh, amount of sugar and the, the nature of the tofu skin. It's just, they can just sit on all day basically. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the fun part about that. What I'm going to talk to you about is this, it's kind of like a, a mushroom grain bowl with the tofu. The tofu adds like a really nice substantial texture to the dish. Um, very, it's different from meat, but not so dissimilar that it's out of place. So it's it's got that like kind of, it makes you like feel full. It gives you that protein and it adds some of these tofus are smoked and some of them are marinated in uh, different spices. So you kind of get that really deep flavor, which is really interesting mm -hmm. to me. I'm not vegan, I'm not vegetarian, I eat everything, I'm a chef. So, <laughs> um, I came at this, this dish in my own way of thinking of dishes as I would in my restaurants. So it's actually, the ingredient is the most important thing. So high quality ingredients is number one. And after tasting this, I was really surprised at how good it was. And it really uh, could stand up to a lot of great flavors. The, uh, the faro 
adds a, it's like, first of all, the, it's got a really deep flavor and the texture is nice. It's better than rice. It's got more of a, more nutrients. Uh, the skin hasn't been shelled, so all those vitamins are still in there, which I like. Uh, and the mushrooms we're using for this is a maitake mushroom, or some uh, people call it hen of the woods. I know it looks kind of weird, but this is my favorite mushroom of all time. We also have shiitake mushrooms and some han shimeji mushrooms. And the good thing about this stuff, mushrooms don't overcook. You can't overcook mushrooms. You can cook them all day, and they're still going to be good. We soak up all the liquid, every all the flavor. So, I didn't catch the name of the top mushroom, the weird looking one. What is the name? What's that? I didn't catch the name of that mushroom, the top one, the weird one. My talkie. Okay. Head of the woods is another name. Ken. You can find it at Whole Foods. You can find it at Gelson's or any Asian market will have it. Hollywood Farmer's Market. Yeah, oh, Hollywood, good. for sure. The Hollywood, the Hollywood Farmer's Market is the most. But you can use any mushrooms you want. You can use trumpets. You can use lion's mane. You want chicken syrup? Um, you can use anything you want. I just like these because it's a little bit more fork friendly or chopstick friendly. It's kind of easy to eat. And all the shapes are different. So it looks really, like visually, it looks really pretty, like in the bowl. Um, we took some butternut squash and we roasted it cut side down at 350 for about 30 minutes until it's nice and soft. Uh, all these flavors were kind of like autumnal. You know, we're looking in the mm -hmm. auto flavor profile because that's where we're at right now. So all this stuff from the farmer's market makes sense right now. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is make a vegetable stock. And the secret weapon to making a really good vegetable stock is this thing called kombu. Oh, kombu. It's, um, it's, it's a kelp, like a seaweed. So you'll find this in Japanese markets, some Chinese markets, Korean markets, and I'll show you a raw piece of this stuff so you know what it looks like. It's going to have this kind of firm but still pliable kind of texture um, with this. The white residue is actually sea salt from the ocean. They take them, they, they take these things out of the ocean and they hope they hang them on like clotheslines on the coast for good combo anyways, and they let them air dry. And the white residue is the salt. So you don't have to wipe it off. If you do want to wipe off the excess salt, I would suggest taking a little napkin with uh, dipped in sake and just kind of wipe it off. And that'll actually add flavor and reduce the amount of sodium. Mm -hmm. So basically what we do is we have filtered water in the pot and we add a piece of kombu and we let it soak overnight or for an hour. If you don't have that amount of time, it's fine. You can just do it, you can just throw it in the pot. Um, also, we have some dried shiitake mushrooms. about two liters of broth and I have about four of these dried shiitake mushrooms. Oh wow. They add a lot of umami. A lot of people are kind of weary about MSG, but this mm -hmm. these two ingredients are primarily where natural MSG comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, you know, the stuff you find in Doritos bags or Cheetos or whatever comes from, it's inspired by this. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna add the shiitake back in there. Uh, the kombu, you don't want to take it past like a simmer. So like a very, very low simmer for an hour will extract the maximum amount of flavor out of this guy. Now you could toss it or you can slice it really, really thin and add it to like cold salads or like ceviches or whatever. It's has like a nice crunch to it, but that's up to you. Uh, I, mean, I would probably have just done something like that, which uh -huh. is sort of classic, but you're you're suggesting something like that. 
we've got some uh, uh, back, background conversation. I got it. You can ask your question okay. now. Okay. Did someone what? have a, a question? I don't know what it was. Okay. Yeah. Keep on going, David. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Was there a question? No, I think there was some confusion. You should just keep on going. Yeah. So, okay, so what I have here is the rest for the vegetable stock. Uh, very traditional, two parts onion, one part carrot, one part celery, um, some black peppercorns, a bay leaf, and we had um, an ear of corn, like just a cob. So mm -hmm. instead of throwing the cobs away, you can use this for vegetable stock and it'll actually sweeten it up a little bit. Oh. So we're just, and uh, just like a, a good sprig of time. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna let that go for no more than 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, it starts to taste kind of muddy. So we'll strain it after 45 minutes. We have some here that's already done. So we don't have to wait. So the next step is going to be execution on this dish. So um, after 45 minutes on the vegetable stock, you want to strain it. You want to, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You want to strain it. And then for the farro, you want to boil it in the vegetable stock kind of the same way you would pasta. So like 15 minutes in boiling vegetable stock and then strain out that vegetable stock. You can save the liquid for soups. You can save it for sauces. There's a lot of vitamins, a lot of minerals in there. And you can also add it to thickened soups. So once it's strained, um, you end up with the cooked farro. It looks a little bit kind of, you can't really, I don't know if you can see it, but the ends will kind of like split and kind of explode a little bit. And that means it's like perfectly cooked. It'll have like a nice substantial little chew on it. Um, not dissimilar from good pasta. So what we're gonna do is add a little bit of grapeseed oil. I would say one and a half tablespoons. You could use olive oil, but if you do, I would suggest a non extra virgin olive oil, something lighter because extra virgin is going to burn because we're heating the pan up so hot. Oh. And then what you'll end up with is like a bitter, a bitter background flavor, which we don't want. We will add extra virgin olive oil at the end for a little bit of flavor and to dress everything kind of like a salad. So you want this guy on full black, high heat, okay? Next up, we're gonna bang out the puree. So once this is cooked and it's kind of like cooled down a little bit, just scoop it out with a spoon. And then we're gonna add it to the blender. And this puree works for a lot of different dishes. It's just a, a nut. you can turn this into a soup. If you use the extra vegetable stock that you can use to cook the farro, add it to the, the butternut squash, you can make like a really beautiful soup out of it too. We're only adding a tiny bit, so we have a, a thick puree that's going to sweeten up even more this dish while celebrating the season. Um, if you go to the Hollywood Farmers Market, you're going to want to go with uh, like Weiser Farms has really good quality squash, a lot of heirloom varieties. It doesn't matter what kind of squash. This is butternut, but you can use anything. All right. So our pan is smoking, right? That's what we want. And I'm going to show you how to break this guy down. So what you want to do is pull it in half and just take these little just rip pieces off of it, just like this. 
Uh, add the rest of your mushrooms. You basically want like an even layer. That's kind of the most. And then for this tofu, we're just going to dice it up. Smells so good right now. Just the, the mushroom, seared mushroom smell is just coming everywhere in the kitchen. Yeah. So just like I said, you can't really overcook mushrooms, so just let it roll. Just roll with it. What you want is like a really deep caramelization on one side, so that'll build the flavor. Caramelization here happening. Mm -hmm. So we're going to let the other side just sear. When you're cooking at home, it seems counterintuitive to just go full blast the whole way, but with this dish, it just it makes sense. So now I'm going to take this, this puree, can you see? Yeah. And then the finished vegetable stock that we, we cook the faro in and we strain. And I'm going to add a tiny bit just to help the, the puree kind of get moving. I feel like quarter cup is good. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. Say a quarter teaspoon, a touch of extra virgin olive oil, say one teaspoon, that's it, I'm going to blend this guy up, I'm going to get loud and violent, I have to turn the break a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, hard as that. That's done. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add half a teaspoon of chopped garlic. And you want to add it on top of the mushrooms, not necessarily on the pan, because we kind of want that raw bite from the garlic. Uh -huh. And then we're going to take two fluid ounces of sake and soy sauce. So it's two parts sake, one part soy. So when you're done, when you're done kind of like moving the, the everything around, the pan should be relatively clean. So when you sear the mushrooms in the pan, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add some farro to that. Say half a cup is good. 
Um, everything that's stuck to the pan that came off the mushrooms gets deglazed by the sake and the soy sauce. So all those flavors come off the pan and go into the mushrooms. So here you have the mushrooms that are hot, the farro that is room temp or warm. I'm gonna add a pinch of flaky salt, like Meldon is good. Any kind of sea salt. I'm gonna add a squeeze of lemon. So it's like just a little lemon cheek. I'd say like half a teaspoon of lemon juice, some leeks that we roasted, just the white parts and the light green. We got some toasted hazelnuts for a little bit of texture. Any kind of green you got. Uh, right now, winter kale is really good. This is arugula. We're gonna add a touch of olive oil. Say half a teaspoon. The black pepper. However much you like, I like a lot. And we're just gonna kind of like toss it together. Just mix it. Okay, so our puree, you don't have to strain it. You don't have to do anything else with it. It's like, it's nice and smooth. It's ready to go. I put a little bit on the bottom. And then if you want to get kind of fancy, you put it here on the, right on the concave of the bowl where it starts to go. You drag the bottom of the spoon and you get that kind of like restaurant-y kind of look, right? And then from here, it's just plating. If you want to, and this, that's pretty much it. Um, very healthy, very filling, um, celebrating whatever season we're in right now, which is autumn. And you're helping, you know, your local farmers. And this can be eaten cold. It can be eaten warm, however you want it. It holds as leftovers. It's great. Um, I make it at home sometimes and I just, bat I, made it, I make like a huge like block size batch of it and I just put it in little containers and then when I get home from work, I just shovel it in my mouth, take a shower and knock out. So wow. it's good, it's good anyway. And uh, if you want to, if you want to take this to the next level, take some of these mushrooms, fry them up in a, like a little bit of oil so they're like crunchy or garlic chips or any kind of like something crunchy would be awesome. But that's the farro mushroom grain bowl. Wow. Can you do a close up of the finished piece? Yeah. Is that close uh, enough? Yeah, maybe yeah. it's a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's oh. a pretty one. Oh. I mean, for myself, I had a bunch of Parmesan to this, like on the top, yeah. shaved Parmesan, but you don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, it's got enough flavor just as it is. Mm. That's the guy. Oh. I think the, the pistachio uh, baklava is not going to be ready from the oven uh, by the time we finish. But we have one that we made yesterday and that it keeps really well because the, the Yuba just like holds its, it holds its form great. Um, so we can show you what the finished finish piece looks like. Um, just so real quick before that, the way to finish the dish, um, it's super simple. Uh, we just take it out of the oven. 
uh, pour on the slightly reduced maple syrup, simple syrup, uh, pour that over the top, it'll sizzle because it's nice and hot. Um, then we'll sprinkle on some chopped pistachios that have been roasted already and some white and black sesame seeds. Um, and that, that basically finishes it up. So here's what it looks like at the end. Um, and am I, are you looking okay? Um, mm -hmm. It's, we, we, we also, um, yeah, so this is, we slice it into pretty small triangles, but you can kind of do whatever, whatever size you like. Um, and uh, we can show a cross section too. It's a little bit finicky. So one thing is, it's, I definitely recommend using parchment paper because that way you can pull it out easily. Um, but a little plate. This is what it looks like from a cross section. Um, so you can see there's really nice layers of the super, super thin uh, Yubo that's now very flaky. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit crisp, but not super crisp. And then inside just a, a thin layer of that pumpkin spiced pistachio and walnut filling. Um, and this stuff, one thing that's nice about it compared to standard baklava is that because this is made out of uh, soybean and not wheat, it doesn't get soggy. So you can actually leave this overnight. You can leave it for a week in your fridge if you want. You could freeze it and reheat it and it's gonna be, it's gonna stay pretty good. Um, it's, it's, it's really nice for that. Uh, but yeah, that's, and that's the pistachio baklava. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions too, we'd uh, love to answer or, or help. We'll definitely send more information with the recipes and, and all that after this. Uh, but if anyone has questions now too, that we can George, have you answer. have you introduced any of these Western based recipes to your friends in China <laughs> to expand their world like you've expanding ours with their ingredients? Not yet. I mean, just message friends and showing them yeah. pictures and been like, wow, that's really cool. But uh, <laughs> since, since COVID, I haven't been able to return to China. But my right. hope is that a lot of these foods, um, I mean, tofu is such a sustainable and healthy food um, that I think could be a really great weapon against climate change. And a mm -hmm. lot of these other issues right now with our meat system. And I hope that one way of, of creating more dialogue between China and the US could be through tofu-based Western cuisine, like mm -hmm. celebrating these Chinese ingredients. Um, right. And you know, I think in the future, that would be so great to, to have, have more dialogue that way. Mm -hmm. George's cookbook also includes things like pizza. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell him some of the other uh, Western-based menus you're making with tofu. We do uh, a buffalo fried tofu sandwich. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> pretty good. Um, There's one type of tofu that um, is really interesting. Uh, it's really only eaten in the area around Shanghai. Uh, which is a big area, but you know, relative to the size of China, it's, it's pretty uncommon. And uh, it's made by taking really thinly pressed tofu sheets, soaking them in this alkaline brine that softens them and gives them a slightly eggy taste. It also cuts a little bit of the beanie flavor. And then they roll those sheets again into a long form. Uh, and so it has a completely different texture than most tofu we have in the States, a completely different flavor. Uh, it's awesome in buffalo sandwiches. It's a little bit spongy. Um, so we really like it uh, for, I don't know, what we use it for like dumplings and soups. It just absorbs all the sauce, all the all the all the broth flavors. Um, we have a we're work we had a um, a horchata tequila milk ice cream like milkshake that came out pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that sounds a good. Different type of tofu too that uh, is uh, one made from soy protein rather than whole soybeans. So a completely different texture. It has a lot of just like body. thickness, a lot of body without much of the flavor. So it's like you get that vanilla bean, you get the toasted almonds, you get that kind of 
horchata flavor, but it's there's a little tequila and filter growing in there too. We have a couple. Uh, we we use this um, tofu in the the far, far, Faro Grain Bowl in a dessert, actual like a caramel whiskey tart, uh, caramel apple whiskey tart, but using that savory tofu that just has those nice wintry spices. Uh, that was pretty pretty nice. Um, yeah, a lot of things. Um, and we'll send more information too if anyone's curious and. And, and chatting with us. I mean, we're always happy to talk. So we'll have our email contact information in there um, and also send more information on the book. We're not really sure exactly when we're coming out yet, but hopefully mm -hmm. early next year. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that- and we have, what is, Oh, I was gonna ask the question, the title of your book is Broken Cuisine. So what's the history of having selected that as a title? So broken cuisine refers to a couple things. Uh, the first is that modern American cuisine is is somewhat broken. It's it's uh, a lot of meat industry is uh, the meat industry is contributing in major ways to climate change, um, but also to other issues like antibiotic resistant superbugs. Uh, we use seventy percent of our medically important antibiotics not on humans but on livestock, and mm. the result is that there's a huge threat of uh, you know superbugs that are formed that develop resistance to these antibiotics and then can spread to humans. Uh, there's also the question of just factory farming. It's incredibly efficient to produce meat and protein for people, but the result is because it's so efficient, it's not great at all for the animals. Um, and so for these reasons, a lot of the Western cuisine just, it's, it's not quite working for us like it used to. Uh, but on the flip side, the alternatives in the plant-based world are not really good enough for most people because most people aren't vegetarian or vegan. Uh, the reason for that is that a lot of these plant-based foods currently are, are somewhat reductionary. They're either subtractive, so you can order a, a chicken salad at your local restaurant and then just take out the chicken. Mm -hmm. Not you know very appealing to most people. You can substitute, so use some mock meat or plant-based meat. Uh, but for that, again, it's a little bit, you know we're not quite at that level where we have realistic replicas for most foods. So that in and of itself is also somewhat reductionary. Uh, and then the third option is traditional foods. So foods that are just naturally plant-based like peanut butter and jelly and oatmeal and all that. Uh, but if you're gonna give someone the option of, you know, peanut butter and jelly and oatmeal or peanut butter and jelly, oatmeal and chicken sandwich and pizza, whatever, all these foods, it's still less than what we had before. So uh, we think that that is broken. It's not gonna, people aren't gonna come to plant-based foods unless we add more. Um, and the purpose of our book was to show that we can create new foods um, and we can do it with new ingredients and these foods can be really interesting. So we can expand our cuisine that is right now is just not serving us like it needs to. Thank you. And someone had a question. Um, what do you think about typical tofu found in regular grocery stores that are uh, in, served in water or stored in water? So the way I love these ingredients, personally, uh, I'm, and I, David, you're also huge into tofu. So um, David cooked uh, for, for a number of years at Katsuya as like a uh, uh, head chef. Yes, I, I spent six agonizing months every single day trying to perfect like the right silken tofu from scratch. So we, we sourced our own organic soybeans, non-GMO, we soaked them, we made soy milk, to get the right texture and just like constantly ongoing uh, madness with trying to get tofu that some, it's so simple, but it's so difficult to nail. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate all the different kinds of tofu that George has introduced me to because the quality on them is very good. Um, you want to talk on the stuff in the store? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, the stuff in the store, we're so lucky how much we have, but it's still uh, maybe not quite what it could be. Um, but I think one issue with the store stuff is that the tofus we have are the main popular varieties in Asia. So again, like you know, oh. silken tofu, firm tofu, soft tofu. Uh, but when you try to translate those tofus into Western cuisine and Western flavor preferences, they don't translate quite as well. Uh, a lot of people find the beaniness of firm tofu to just not be you know, great and they don't like maybe the texture, the cakiness or the slipperiness. Um, so the reason why we're focusing on these other varieties is that we think that they could be more appealing potentially to Americans uh, because they don't have those same 
challenges and they also have other strengths to them. Um, so we're, we love all tofus, but I think in the Western cuisine context, it might be helpful to explore some of these other varieties too. Yeah, I use the stuff in the store all the time at home. So there, there's nothing bad about them. I use them, so, but these, these tofus just have so much more to offer in texture and flavor. So that's kind of why we're leaning more in that direction. Mm. Oh, wow. Well, this is fascinating because um, in all my cooking magazines, it's, oh, you can substitute tofu. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know about that, but right. you two gentlemen have shown us how we can do this. And also I love the, um, it looks very straightforward, the baklava, because that's one of those things that to me has been a, a dish of mystery. And then the, um, and I love, we use a lot of farro at our house so that that green bowl looks phenomenal. Farro and mushrooms, I mean, that's as, about as good as it gets. Yep. Thank you so much. Does anybody other, have any other questions? This has just been terrific. And uh, just yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. And, and I also, so yeah, I appreciated the uh, technique on the mushrooms, cooking the mushrooms, because they're always, you know, it seems like it's so easy, but they, they take a certain amount of attention. It's easy attention, but we're, we're, I'm going to be looking for some hen of the woods. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So yeah. good. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And we look forward to Broken Cuisine. We'll have a book signing at the eBell because we'll be open. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. And do send us the recipes. Yeah. It's yeah. Real. We'll make sure those get out. Yeah. But thank you. That's, this has really been wonderful. Thank you for putting the time and the effort into this and, and um, for sharing your experience because it's an, it's been a, for you, George, in particular, pretty fascinating journey is what it sounds like to me. It's just been totally fun, uh, just following, following curiosity all the way. Um, yeah. oh. Thanks so much for having us. This was great. Yeah, wow. thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. you. Lots, of, lots of comments in the chat. Lots of thank yous here. If you want to take a look from everybody. And I just do want to remind everybody of the upcoming programs that we can look forward to. Um, next Wednesday is our next Zoom in the evening of called Mindful Veterans. We're having a panel discussion where we will have women from the arm, all branches from the armed forces talking about uh, their lives and how it's affected them and lots of upbeat things. And um, following that, we're going to have some great field trips coming up. Um, and we've just just now um, learned about some special free tickets to for our members to the uh, Charles Dickens Christmas Carol uh, presentation coming up on November 30th at the Amundsen Theater. And then we're going to have a field trip on December 15th to SoFi Stadium, a tour, a group tour. And we're having um, on December 6th in the evening, another Zoom on um, Dr. Rosalie Lopez from um, NASA and uh, JPL, who is going to tell us about volcanoes and in the solar system. She's quite um, the expert in authority on these. and. She is, uh, you probably might have seen her on Nova or Discovery Channel. She's uh, got a very public face to her expertise. And then see what else, uh, of course, our big holiday boutique on December 8th that we all look forward to from 10 to six. And there will be a formal luncheon or a casual box luncheon, or you can just come to shop. So that's our big holiday event. So I. I think I've got everything there coming up through December. So um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And any, nobody else has any other messages. Um, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, look for Broken Cuisine recipes. Yeah.
And yeah, look thank at the you. Cookbook. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye.